God gave me a whole lot more insight this afternoon in study. And I guess the time just wasn't right. My voice went out about five minutes into this message. And we closed. I pray you don't remember. But I feel like God has given me some insight. In the day and time that we're living in. Uh, it's, say what you will. It's the end time. I, I never thought when I come into the church. And I've heard it preached time and time again. Never did I really think, Brother Bill, that I would be seeing and living the end times. Brother David, it's all around us. Everywhere you look, it's all around us. Prophecy being fulfilled right before our very eyes. So with that being said, I want to preach to us tonight. With the Lord laid on my heart. Mark chapter 13, verse 34 through 37. Pray that my voice will. Mark 13, verse 34 through 37. There's your Bible, real sister Tori. Sorry. Did you find it real quick? Inside joke. Mark chapter 13, verse 34. We've heard this scripture time and time again. But we'll hear it one more time tonight. The Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants. And every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he finds you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto you all, watch. I got a very simple title for this message tonight. Two minute warning. And I promise you I'll make this fit very clear. If you lift your hands and ask God's anointing on this message, on your heart and your mind to receive the word that God has for us. God, we love you. Thank you for your blessing. Thank you for your spirit to fill this place tonight, God. Knowing my heart and my mind, God, and on my voice, Lord. God, that we can preach your word. God, minister in this place. God, without your anointing, it is just my word. God, let the anointing break the yoke of bondage tonight, God. In the name of Jesus. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated if you'll preach with me. We are in the height of football season and sports season. And uh, this, this right here fits so well. And for you that know anything about sports, you'll know exactly where I'm going with this. But for those of you that are not so uh, athletic inclined and sport minded, let me fill you in on a little bit of this tonight. The two minute warning is something that takes place at the end of a certain, certain sporting event. Uh, mostly it's football. It's an alarm or a buzzer that goes off or it's a, a pause in the game to let the participants know that there are only two minutes left in the game. It lets you know that you don't have much time left. It tells the opponents one of two things. One, I've either got to score some points to win this game, or two, I've got to hold the lead for just two more minutes. It is most times the crucial point of the game. Lots of games are won or lost inside of that two-minute mark. And I will not rehash bad memories of last night's game. Uh, these altars these would altars be full of people weeping and crying if I rehash everything that happened last night within the last two minutes. Amen. Amen. But when the two minute, when the two minute warning sounds, things are very, very critical. When the two minute warning sounds, it is very important the way that you play the game, as we can tell last time. You can't afford to be lax during this time, Brother David. You don't have that time and luxury to be able to sit back and take it easy. You can't afford to be casual at the two-minute warning time. There is way too much at stake. There is too much to be won or too much to be lost. 
When the two minute warning sounds, you must be at your very best. If you listen to Coach Rick, which is the University of Georgia Bulldogs that got beat last night, the coach, he says finish the drill. And the reason you finish the drill is to prepare you for moments like the two minute warning. That you suck it up and finish the drill. You're going to make it the extra mile. But let, let me, I could give many examples of teams or, or people who either let down or, or lost or, or teams that are people who dug in and held on to score and win the game. But let me give you an example. There was a boxing match between Oscar De La Hoya and Felix Trinidad. Through the majority of the fight, Oscar De La Hoya, he, he was winning by a wide, wide stretch. He had a massive margin on Felix Trinidad. He was outboxing his opponent like crazy. He was outpunching his opponent. He was literally winning the fight round by round, punch by punch. But during the last four rounds, he decided that he was far enough ahead that he could just let up a little bit. He had the stamina to finish strong, but he decided that he could coast to his victory. The outcome of the fight was Felix Trinidad beat Oscar De La Hoya because he finished strong. When the tough got going, Felix Trinidad stepped up to the plate and finished in the last four rounds. During crunch time, he came on strong. During the two-minute warning, if you will, he gave it his best, and he won the fight. I know most of you do not watch it, and I won't elaborate too much. But football, as I've already said, is another illustration. Just this year alone, several teams have went into their final quarter of play, winning by what seemed to be enough to seal a victory. So they decided to take it a little easy in the final minutes of play. Just to come down to mere seconds left in the game to play. And all of a sudden, they are now in a situation that they could have very well lost the game. And in the very last seconds of the game, the other team pulls off an unbelievable 50-yard field goal to win the game. They come back in the last two minutes and they suck it up and they finish the drill and win. And they lost the game for the other team all because in the last few moments of the game, they became very relaxed and the enemy was able to take advantage and pull off amazing victory. I said all that to say this. In my soul and in my heart, there's an urgency. There's a stirring going on in the church, in the hearts and minds of saints of God today. There is a two-minute warning. And I believe without a shadow of a doubt, Brother Jimmy, we are living at the two-minute warning. I believe God has sent pastors and preachers and evangelists along our way to tell us to sound the warning, to be the watchman on the wall, to let us know, Brother Scott, we are at the last two minutes of the game. And it's no time for us to stop and relax and be comfortable and casual in our spiritual walk with God. It's time, if anything, to step up our game, step up our prayer life, step up our fasting, step up I got to call somebody. Don't make me drag this by myself tonight. It's time that we either give it our best shot or we give up all together. It's time that we live for God with all of our strength or we go ahead and live for the devil. It's time that we draw near to God or draw near to the world. It's time that we live a holy and godly life or just go ahead and live like the world. It's time that we live according to the word of God and live according to his plan or go ahead and live according to the morals of this age and of this world. It's time. Hear me now. It's time to get ourselves in the church. It's time that we get ourselves at Bible study. It's time that we get ourselves at prayer meeting. It's time that we get involved into the church that is living in the last days with everything that you got. Or just stay at home if you're going to be lukewarm. This is the mindset 
of the two minute drill. This is the mindset. You give it everything that you got. Because it's so easy to let up and let the world take you, consume you, and destroy every ounce of God that you've got in your life. It's not time, my friend, for the child of God to get casual and lax and to take it easy. But I say it's two minute warning. <laughs> Hear me tonight. I'm the preacher of the hour. It is two minute warning time. It's time to wake up and realize the day and the hour that we're living in. It's time to get serious about our walk with God. I'm not condemning you tonight, but I'm trying to get through to some of us that we've been taking it easy for way too long. We've been sitting in the back pew, so to speak. No, no, nothing against Brother Charles and those that are on the back pew. But spiritually, we've been taking a back seat when all the time God's saying, I've been sounding the warning. It's two minute drill time. It's time to get in this thing. Get in, get out, or get run over. I don't know about you tonight. I want to heed to the call. I want to get into this thing with every ounce of energy that I have. More than ever, we need to pay attention to our walk with God. More than ever, we need to pay attention to our prayer life, our heart, and our attitude, the way we think, the way we act, the way we speak. We need to pay more attention in these last days to all of these things and then some. We've got to realize we are living in the last days and prophecy is being fulfilled that God's getting ready to come after His church. And I can't let Him find me sleeping. Or finding you lacks. God's getting ready to come. Luke 21 and 7, verse 11 through 11. And they asked him. Say, Master, but when shall these things be? And what sign shall there be when these things shall come to pass? And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived. Don't be tricked. Don't be lied to. Don't believe the lies of the world that we're living in. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them, but when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be in divers places, and famines, and pestilence, and fearful sights, and great signs shall be from heaven. Amen. Nation against nation. Amen. When has there ever been a time in American history or the history of this world that there has ever been more nations that are fighting at this present time than right now? Amen. You can't turn on Fox News without there being somebody else getting ready to blow somebody else up. And then if they blow them up, we're going to go against this nation and we're going to blow them up. Nation against nation. All the earthquakes. Jesus said all these things must happen. But don't be afraid. Rather be encouraged because it's just my two minute warning. I've been prepping you. I've been training you through your pastor's and your evangelists and your teachers, I've been molding you for this time. For this day and this hour. Don't be afraid, Brother Scott, when these things come to pass. He said there should be signs. In the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. 
for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud of power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up. Lift up your head. Why? Because your redemption draweth not. When you see these things, Brother Mickey, taking place, don't get worried. Don't be fearful. But yet you need to start looking up because our redemption, the day that we've been waiting on, is about to come. And God's about to take us home to that eternal place of happiness and rest. The Bible points out the signs of the two-minute warning of Jesus' second return. Luke says that we should take heed that we are not deceived. For many will say that they have found another way than that of the word of God and lead many astray. Never has there been a day and time where people are following every false doctrine just to satisfy their conscience and to soothe their conscience. But we've got to make sure that we've got the infallible word of God hid in our heart on a daily basis. And the only way that you can do that is to get in his word. Don't be deceived. Don't let don't 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 go away and be swayed by every wind of doctrine that's out there. Because my friend, there's a bunch of different doctrines out there. And you can find one that will soothe your conscience and soothe your soul. But I want, Brother Matt, that when I get into the Word of God, that if I need correcting, I want it to correct me. I don't want something that's going to soothe. My conscience, Brother Bill, and me go to hell. I want the word that's going to skin my knees. It's going to peel back my shins every now and then. And it's going to step on my toes. That lets me know God still loves me enough to correct me. We will hear wars and commotions, but don't be frightened. It's just another sign that Jesus is coming soon. Nation will rise against nation. It's not time. Hear me, church. I know this isn't fast and furious and we're not jumping off the walls. But this is so important in these last days that we understand. Don't get lukewarm in your walk with God. But it's time for us to get on fire with everything set a fire. God set a fire in my soul. One that I can't contain, that I can't control. One thing about fires is that whenever it starts burning, it will consume whatever is in its path. And I pray God, set a fire. I want a Holy Ghost fire to be set on the inside of me that I don't want to control, that I don't want to contain. And if I don't control it and I don't contain it, then God's going to let it consume everything that doesn't need to be there. And I'm better off. Set a fire. There will be earthquakes in diverse places. Just recently in the past few years, there have been great earthquakes all over the world. Where earthquakes don't normally happen, don't normally take place, they have caused much destruction and loss of life. What is it? It's just another sign. I'm not a sign seeker, but when the Bible points out very clearly what to look for, and I see them, it's signs. It's just another sign. It's another two minute warning. Jesus is getting ready. And I have got to be ready. There will be famines and pestilence and fearful sights in the land. There will be great signs from heaven. Signs of the sun and the moon. We have witnessed some of the biggest hurricanes to ever come our way in the last ten years. We know what is going on right now in the Philippines today with all the destruction from the typhoons. I'm talking about some of the biggest typhoons in the history of this world that is recorded Amen. are taking place right now. Right. They are causing so much destruction and chaos. And when I see these things, I say, oh God, how much longer? I know I'm under the two minute warning right now. How much longer? Before I see the clouds split and I hear the trumpet sound. Brother Robbins, I don't want that to be a fearful day. And in order for that to be a glorious day, I've got to stay in the church. No time. No time to stay comfortable and stay in your rut. If you ain't going forward, you're going back. A 
They say you hold your spot on the line in a football game. I'm sorry. I've been there. You ain't holding nothing. If you ain't going forward, you're going backward. Same thing spiritually. If we are not moving forward, we're moving backward. And now is not a time to be falling backwards. Why am I preaching like this today? I feel so much that a two-minute warning is in my soul right now. God is ready. I know I have reiterated this. God is getting ready for his bride. He's coming for a church. Now get this. This is important. He's coming for a church that has neither spot, wrinkle, blemish, or any such thing. He's coming for a church that has their lamps filled with the Holy Ghost. He's coming for a church that has been washed in the blood of the Lamb. He is coming for a church that has been baptized into His body. He's coming for a church that is looking and longing for His return. He is coming for a church that has their wedding garments on and their lamps are burning. He is coming for a church that His name is applied to their lives. Church, it is time. It's a two-minute warning that is sounding as we speak. God's getting ready to come. And I've got to be without spot and wrinkle and blemish. And I've got to be ready when He calls us home. Brother like you scared me to death. This is not a scary thing to those who are living for God with all of their strength and their mind and their soul. But rather it is something that brings hope to every believer. How can such terrible things bring hope to anyone? It brings hope because we know it's almost homecoming time. It brings us hope because Jesus is about to get his bride. There will be no more sickness. There's no more pain. No more sadness. No more pardon. No more sorrow. No more tears. No more trials. No more hard times. No more rough roads. No more hills to climb. No more valleys. No more mountains to climb. Forever and ever we will be in the city where the Lamb, Jesus, is the light. We will forever be with our Savior. That's why we have a hope tonight. Titus chapter 2 and 13, looking for that blessed hope. And the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. It is a blessed hope. First Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. It's a comforting hope tonight to know that one day I'm going to go home to meet with my Savior. 1 Peter 1 and 3, and I'm trying to wind this down. Blessed be the God. And Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Let me tell you, this is not a hope like the world. This is not a dead hope that died years ago, but it is a lively hope. John tells us, beloved, now we are... sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. It is a purifying and cleansing hope tonight. Hebrews 6, 18 and 19. That by two of you
things in which it was impossible for God to lie. We might have a strong consolation who had fled for a refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Listen to this right here. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Both steadfast, sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. I saw a video of Sister Hopkins. Everybody knew her brother, Sister Hopkins, the evangelist, pastor in Zane, Ohio right now. They went to Germany for a, a conference and, and missions. And Sister Hopkins posted a video of her with the Bible. And as she held this Bible, she done a drama. And she done it to the anchor holds. You say, Rick, what's, what's this got to do with it? Let me tell you about the day and hour that we're living in. Brother Chad, I need some anchors. Brother Matt, I need a weak anchor. A weaker anchor. For those of you that like a little visual aid, let me show you. Let me give you just a little picture. Here is my hope. You ain't my hope. You ain't my hope. I needed a strong anchor and not so strong world. Look, brother man. I've got an anchor, a hope, an anchor that goes to that. That's in the veil. Do you know what that is? It's talking about Jesus. Right there in the veil. And I have a hope, Brother Morris, that in the day and hour that I am living in, that when I am locked to that that was in the veil, that is in the veil, when everything that happens comes to pull me away, come on, world, pull me. You're an anchor, you're not supposed to move. <laughs> Keeping you from the world. You're an anchor that keeps me steadfast and sure. As the world comes by, I'm ready. My anchor's ready. He's holding for help. <laughs> Do you, do you see what's happening here? Do you see it? Nice already wore out. The world's already wore out. They can't handle it. They can't handle the hope that I have in the veil tonight. Wait a minute, you're not supposed to move. You're breaking my arm. Hold on. Jesus' name. Every wind of doctrine, every trouble, every trial, not much of a hard world. That pulls me. I am locked to that that was in the veil. Which is in the veil, my hope in Jesus Christ. No matter what comes my way, no matter what wind tosses me, stay angry. No matter what tosses me to and fro, as long as I've got a hold to that which is in the veil, I have a blessed hope. I have a hope that when all trouble comes my way, I am anchored to that which is in the veil. It is an anchor that's going to hold me when the storms of this life come my way. tries to sway you and he messes with your mind is when the anchor is still on a hold. And trust me. Trust me. Listen to this young creature. I may not be old but I understand some things in this walk with God. God's given me some intellect into this I guess. Some insight. You're living in a day and time that when the two minute warning sounds, guess what's happening in the spirit world? Mm. On my back. Just hold on. Don't jump on me. I'll fall. In this day and time, Brother Morris, when the two minute warning sounds, the devil knows that he's got to step up his game in order to take you down. And you've got the man of God in your life sounding the warning that you better step up your game because the enemy is on the prowl and he is ready when he heard the ref, when he heard the pastor sound the two minute warning. He said, I've got to step up every avenue that I can and he's going to jump on your back and he's going to weigh you down to the point that you don't think you can do anything else for the kingdom of God. But Anchor to that. Right. It's an anchoring hope. Right. 
In troubled times, I've got hope. In perplexing times, I've got hope. In sickness, I've got hope. In pain, I've got hope. In sorrow and sadness, I've got hope. In hard times, in dark days, in many, many valleys to go through, I've still got a hope that's going to anchor me. It's going to keep me. No matter what comes my way, as long as I'm anchored, I ain't going to move. The purpose of an anchor is to keep a ship from moving when the wind picks up and the waves begin to beat the ship. And they say for a big ship at sea, it can't just lift the anchor because it holds so deep and so strong. That they literally had to start backing up from the anchor's spot that it's holding to release the anchor. My friend, when the anchor lets go in your life, it's not the anchor. I know that's blowing your mind right now. Because the anchor is on hold. The ship is the one that lets the anchor get out of its place. You tonight, you have to back up spiritually and release the anchor. God's not letting go of you. But you're letting go of God. Amen. And you start backing up. And you start letting down when the two minute warning sounds. I'm here to tell somebody tonight you got an anchor in hope in Jesus. You better keep moving forward. Because the moment you step back, you're letting go of the anchor. It's a great hope. It's a blessed hope. It's a comforting hope. A lively hope. A purifying hope. And an anchoring hope. If you're here today and you want this kind of hope in your life, I know we've had a blowout service. People getting renewed in the Holy Ghost. And I feel like God had this for a reason. And you, you, needed, you needed a word tonight. If you're here today and you have this kind of hope, I want you to know that you had it in the past and you no longer have it. I want you to know tonight you can find that hope. You didn't come tonight just by chance. God appointed it. God appointed you to be here because he knew what you needed and what was going to be done in this service. And if you've lost hope, I want to tell you, you can find it at the altar. Can I get an amen, Brother Chad? Amen. Amen. As long as you're feeling the convicting power of God in your life, you still have. Say to Peter 1 and 10, wherefore... Rather, brother, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fail. Musicians can come back to their instruments. That means I, I have to live in such a way as to be sure. You have to live in such a way to be sure you will rise to meet the Lord in the air when He comes. I would hate for it to happen that when the Lord returned, He would say you didn't do everything that you needed to do to be a part of the bride of Christ. You let some things keep you and creep into your life that didn't belong there. And at that time, when we stand before God, it's too late to fix things. But you have a chance tonight. Who knows what's going to happen when we leave this place, Brother Bill. When it's time for me to go. It's time for me to go. Life is short, but a vapor. I don't know when my time is up. So I say tonight, take advantage of the opportunity at hand. We still have time today to make our calling 
and our election sure. Why don't you make it as sure as you can tonight? Don't leave this place without finding hope, peace, and happiness. The Bible says it's joy unspeakable and full of glory. And it's right here and it's free. If you've never had that hope that we're talking about, you can have it before you leave. All it takes is repentance. Understand that. It starts with repentance. Water baptism in Jesus' name. Receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. And living a holy and godly life with everything that is within you. It's too been a warning time. God is getting ready to come. Can we stand on our feet right now?